All right, we're going to talk about why meaning matters. If I asked you what that word meant, most of you would say, well, that depends. Depends on the context. So let's give it some context. How about now? You might think implied beauty, handsome, good looks, what have you. Let's change the context. How about now? Now you might think, oh, this is about heat, temperature. Words in and of themselves have no meaning. A word has no meaning in and of itself. Its meaning is dependent on the other words that surround it. What something means depends on the context it is placed into. This is, by the way, I've just given you a crash course on structuralism, structural anthropology. Words by themselves have no meaning. It depends on the context they're placed into. So let's apply that back to the word hot. Here, if the context is tall, six-pack, sexy, you'll think implied beauty. If I change that to tea, coffee, morning, you'll think heat, temperature. Again, words have no meaning in and of themselves. So in order to explain this concept, I'm going to run a little bit of a thought experiment. But before I do that, I want to set up the stage for you. Why am I talking about meaning? I'm talking about meaning because nothing really means what we think it means. And this is true of everything, the categories, the products, the businesses we all operate in. Things don't always mean what we think they mean. And to illustrate that point, we're going to run through a little bit of a experiment, a thought experiment, if you will. And I'm going to use the, uh, a thought experiment of opposites. As human beings, we like being able to understand something by looking at what it is not. So we're going to do an exercise of opposites. And I'm going to demonstrate to you how meaning is anything but what you think it is. So we're going to start by thinking about what is the opposite of nature. By the way, I posted a poll uh, on this on LinkedIn, and most of the people responded back and said it's nurture. It's not. The opposite of nature is actually pleasure. Why is that the case? It's the case because today, and this is in today's context, I'm not talking about history, today, the meaning of nature has become something that requires extra work in our lives to bring nature into the food we eat to bring nature into our lives, whether it's going for a hike, going for a walk, to, to understand the nature of other human beings. Everything requires hard work. It requires us to get outside our comfort zone. So the opposite of nature today is actually pleasure, pure hedonism, pleasure. As, as little work as possible, just enjoy uh, whatever it is you're trying to enjoy. So let's do another one, aging. Uh, I posted this one on LinkedIn, too. Everybody said youthfulness. It's not the opposite of aging. Again, it's because of what aging means in culture today. The opposite of aging is living. Why is that the case? Because aging requires us to constantly think about the future. It requires us to take ourselves out of the present moment. It requires us to stop living our lives in the present moment, living in the moment. So the opposite of aging is living. Let's do the last one, nourishment. Again, uh, the opposite of nourishment is also something that is a result of how our culture is transpiring. It's ease. Today, in culture, anything that's easy is assumed to lack nourishment, whether it's literally for the body in terms of nutrients in nutrition or figuratively in terms of nourishing our souls. The opposite of nourishment is ease. Why am I showing this to you? I'm showing this to you to illustrate the point that the things you think you know aren't seemingly this, the, the same. Everything has meaning, and meaning is anything but what you think it is. And here's probably a stark statistic. I have hundreds of conversations with tons of business leaders. Some of them we work with. Some of them I interview just for the sake of writing books. And in a lot of these conversations, I find more than seven out of the 10 people I meet don't fully understand the categories they play within. And the reason they don't fully understand the categories they play within is because their notion of that category is an industry-led idea. 
Oh, I play in the beverage category, the carbonated beverage category. What is that? It's a structured framework given to them by the industry, by the organization. Nobody takes a step back to think, what does a carbonated beverage mean to people, to consumers in today's context, and how is that meaning changing, and what is driving that change? This is why meaning matters. Now let's add a little bit of complexity to this equation. I talked about how meaning is important, what it is, why it, it, it's something that is unexpected often, but meaning is also pluralistic in the sense that something doesn't only mean one thing at any given point in time. You can have multiple meanings coexist. Sometimes you can have meanings that are contradictory coexist, and that's culture, that's normal. Something can mean two, three, five, seven different things in culture, and some of those things can be contradictory, and that's okay. That's okay for the consumer. As human beings, we all exist with contradictions in our minds. We don't always articulate that when we talk to one another, but we, we exist with those contradictions in our minds. So meaning is pluralistic. And I want to demonstrate this to you by, by sharing a little bit of research that we've done on the future of work. And I'm sharing a very, very simplified version of it, but nonetheless, an important one for the purpose of illustrating this point. So what you're seeing on your screen is the pre-pandemic analysis. So this is pre-2020 analysis of the meanings around work. And you'll see the biggest bubbles are around work-life balance, horrible bosses. Horrible bosses really refers to toxic work environments. And you'll see there's conversation, dominant meanings around pay and passion, all as expected. Again, there's a reason why the movie Horrible Bosses was successful pre-pandemic. You can't make that in today's context, and here's why. Because the meanings around work have completely changed. Today, the dominant meaning shaping the future of work is this notion of fulfillment. Do I feel like I'm achieving something in my day-to-day -day life, in my work? Another, another core uh, meaning is around purpose, this notion that, you know, does my work have a sense of direction? And then discussions of pay has been replaced by discussions of benefits. You're seeing discussions of work culture still. But the reason I'm demonstrating this to you is because A, meaning is pluralistic. Many meanings coexist. But B, meaning is constantly changing. So if we take an idea of a category that we may have had even two years ago, what that means today will be different. Sometimes there are nuanced differences. Sometimes it's dramatic. And there, we, none of us can control that. That's just culture. Meaning is pluralistic, and meaning is constantly changing and evolving, which means for all of us, the most important aspect of understanding this is to figure out in what direction is meaning changing, and how can we measure that rate of change, and how can we understand where that might be headed in a way that allows us to be proactive rather than constantly being reactive. So let's talk a little bit about how meaning is made. And I'm going to illustrate this point by, again, taking a simplified example. And I'm going to take the example of plant protein. So again, coming back to the core concept we began with, nothing has meaning in and of itself. Meaning is dependent on the words that surround it. Okay, so let's take the simplified illustrative example where plant protein has three core sets of meanings. Meanings around nutrition, so the nutritional profile of plant protein meanings around recipes and how to cook with it, and then meanings around taste. Okay, so let's take this simplified example. Now here's how culture naturally plays out. What'll happen is, as consumers discuss nutrition and its connection to plant protein, the conversation will evolve. It'll evolve into specifics about nutrition. So people may go into B12 and iron and magnesium and what have you. Now, as they discuss that, it'll then evolve again and then this time it may evolve into the culture of aging, it may connect into the culture of women's health and aging, and so on. Now what's happening here is the circles in white there, the reason they're in a different color is because we consider them, as anthropologists, we consider those implied meanings. Now why are they implied? Because they're associations of associations, they're relationships of relationships. But the problem is those implied meanings are doing two very important things. One, they're shaping our decisions as consumers, and we can't access them. We can't easily articulate them, but it's, but it's impacting our decisions. The second is the implied meanings teach us about where culture is headed. The implied meanings give us foresight. The implied meanings take us to places that already 
isn't uh, mainstream. So that's why the implied side of the equation becomes very critical. Now, here's how culture plays out. As people discuss aging in the context of B12 or iron or magnesium or what have you, and as that conversation strengthens, you might have a new relationship established. And this time, there's a direct connection. People are establishing a direct connection between nutrition as a whole and aging. And then over time, if the strength of that conversation starts to really, uh, really accelerate, aging will start to move closer to nutrition eventually becoming a direct association. Now, why am I showing this to you? Because by this time, it's already well known in culture. So if you wait until you figure out that aging is now a dominant relationship in the context of plant protein, it's already too late. All your competitors know this, everyone knows this, anybody can access this, ask a consumer a question, they will tell you. So the whole point about understanding meaning is that it allows us to understand, it gives us a sense of direction, it allows us to understand where things are headed and allows us to then bring that foresight into a natural process that we can apply into our work. Now, I wanna close this session with a very important um, discussion on how to apply meaning into the work itself. And in particular, I want to talk about two very important concepts because everybody always asks me, anytime we discuss the notion of meaning and we talk about it, everybody says, okay, that's great, but how do you use it? And there are two very significant implications of understanding and decoding meaning for an organization. The first implication is this idea of activating against meanings rather than audiences. Okay, so I want to pause here for a second. This is a, this is a big statement activating against meanings rather than audiences. All of us in this room, I'm sure, have audience profiles for our companies. We give them names, we have demographics associated with them, and we have lifestyle attributes and all of this other stuff. The problem is meaning precedes demographics. Demographics don't create meaning. Meaning precedes demographics. Meaning develops and it brings consumers along for the ride. So here's what happens when you activate against meaning. Not only do you activate against where culture is headed, if you're a surfer, you're, you've caught the wave, you're riding the wave naturally. And if that wave becomes bigger over time because it's bringing more people along for the ride, great. But you're riding the wave to the direction it's supposed to go in. But if you're not doing that, if you're not activating against meanings, but rather activating against demographics, what's happening is you're the wannabe surfer sitting in the water holding, for, holding onto that surfboard for dear life, hoping that somehow you will land to shore, and you may never. And that's the challenge. This is a significant challenge. This is bigger than uh, I, I'm doing justice to it right now because our organizations are not set up for this. And this is also partly why, after this session, I'm gonna have Lisa from Mars Wrigley come and talk, talk to me and have a bit of a conversation because this is a difficult thing to do within organizations. Meaning gives us direction. Meaning allows us to head in a natural direction that consumers are headed in anyway, that culture is headed in anyway, but it requires us to change our frame, our lens. Really important, meaning precedes demographics. There is no one demographic that creates culture. It's impossible. If somebody tells you that, do not believe them. It doesn't exist. Meaning precedes demographics. So here's the question I want to leave you all with today. Do you think you fully understand the cultures you play in today? And I say cultures loosely, by the way. A culture is a category, is a marketplace, is an industry. It's a country you operate within as well. Do you fully understand the cultures you play within? And perhaps more importantly, do you fully understand the cultures you want to play within in the future? And if the answer is, I'm not sure, then you're at the right place. This is why meaning matters. And this is, of course, near and dear to my heart as an anthropologist, but it's, but it's also something that is uh, exciting for us because we're seeing the impact of this type of thinking in changing the way we build a consumer-centric organization uh, across the globe. So 
I, I really appreciate uh, all of you uh, giving me uh, your time to listen. Here's my contact information if you ever want to reach me. Thank you.